Hi, this is Cooper Jocelyn, uh, and I'm here with Jeremy. I will pass this over to you, and uh, you can do a quick intro. Testing, testing. Yes, amazing. The audio is working. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Jeremy Penn. I use she, they pronouns. I am, as of right now, 28 years old. I am from Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and I live in Washington, D.C. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, I uh, have kind of just been starting these off like way at the beginning. Um, so, uh, you know, quick description of where and when were you born, and then we'll kind of launch off from there. Yeah. Uh, so I am Ashkenazi Jewish. I am descended from a bunch of like early 20th century Jewish immigrants through New York City who ended up in sort of the larger Northeastern region. I, my parents are both from New Jersey and I was born and raised there in Cherry Hill, uh, South Jersey, right outside of Philly with my two sisters. Cool. Um, Cherry Hill. I think we have, Callie and I have passed that driving to uh, Philly. Um, what was it like growing up there? Uh, for starters, you've almost certainly passed it because it's right on 295. Uh, yes. <laughs> Um, what was it like growing up in Cherry Hill? I my experiences were that I didn't have the language to describe what it was like growing up until I had left home. Uh, so I grew up all 18 years there. My sisters and I, uh, my parents never really moved um, until after we had all gone off to college. And like, I didn't have the words for it at the time, but I could perceive um, like my society's discomfort with issues of racism, sexism, classism, et cetera. Um, and my own distaste for that discomfort. Um, and so I could tell very early on that I did not quite fit in with what that environment was like, but at the same time, uh, growing up Jewish in a space that was majority Jewish is a rarity um, in the United States. And so there were a lot of issues interpersonally and structurally for me um, growing up in Cherry Hill, but I also was able to find a space or had spaces, not necessarily had to find them, um, was provided with spaces that were much safer than some of the alternatives that exist even right now um, around the country. Um, so, you know, my town was about 50% Jewish. We got, you know, our public schools closed for the Jewish High Holy Days because so few students would attend. Um, and, you know, we had cousins who live not far away, like a half hour drive away and their experience was just totally different because they were in a different town. Um, but, you know, I, again, also like, it, it's like a very, uh, racially and class divided suburb. Um, so like predominantly white and Jewish on one side of town, predominantly folks of color on the other, divided by the interstate highway system, as is true for most of the country as a result of the 20th century uh, infrastructural projects by this country. And so there was like, and that was really obvious even by, um, you know, we, we also had a number of like wealthier families and communities of color in the town that were sort of like more in immigrant communities and like there was even there a like class distinction between poor communities even within racial groups um that i distinctly recall classmates of mine making remarks about people who lived in like the west side of cherry hill even though they themselves were folks of color experiencing racism on the east side of the city um technically it's a city <laughs> it's just big enough it eeks by um <laughs> I really kept my nose down and out of a lot of stuff. I grew up in a very abusive household uh, and like 
for me, it was I am going to just get my work done as much as possible so I can get into a really good school and get the hell out of Cherry Hill. Um, and, you know, and, you know, family is complicated. I'm still in touch with most of my family. Um, but especially once I started figuring out at the time my sexuality and then later on my gender, um, there was definitely this like, oh no, like simultaneously I feel very unsafe, even as I reckon with the fact that this is a space that is ostensibly supposed to be safe, not just in that it should be safe, but in that it kind of claims to be safe, right? Like it's a very, you know, like Cherry Hill's like a very white liberal space. Um, like it's a very particular valence of like what that image is supposed to be um, or like uh, that image it has of itself of what it's supposed to be. And, you know, its own self image is certainly not what I experienced. I still remember getting called um, like a faggot when I first came out um, in high school. I, that was, I was in 10th grade. It was spring 2011. Um, and I remember having like a wide array of reactions from folks, like some folks who were like Jewish and religious who were like, this is like, even within the Jewish context, like, Oh, like I'm going to tell you that this is a sin. And then I had folks who were like very, very affirmational and very, very affirming. Um, and also not surprisingly over the many, uh, this year is like 10 years since I graduated high school. Um, a number of my close friends who have also since realized that they are queer in some way, shape, or form. Um, and so it's truly funny that so many of us found each other so young before we knew that we were queer, but we knew that we were not whatever this thing was. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I, um, I definitely relate to the concept of being in a place that is supposed to be safe, like, you know, and views itself as that. But it's not quite that. <laughs> like I, I totally feel you on that front. Um, your uh, your answer actually really rolls into the next question well, which is, um, what is your first memory of thinking about gender, and that can be your gender or somebody else's? Yeah, I was actually thinking about this recently. So I don't know if it's my first. Um, there are like a few things. Um, I remember some, like, just basic, like, childhood mistakes, so, uh, mistakes is the wrong word. I remember thinking that because my dad was approximately six months older than my mom, that all dads were older than all moms. <laughs> just, like, basic things like that. Um, uh, I, not gender-related, but I similarly, for a while, couldn't understand why I was not older than my older sister, because I was born in June and she was born in July. <laughs> And I, I had not quite grasped years yet as a concept. Um, uh, so I do recall um, early, early on in elementary school, um, there was this one girl who um, was, like, like, was like physically a bully to me and other um, kids. Oh, it looks like I froze. Um, that's just the visual. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, I can, I can still see you. You're still moving for me. So fingers crossed. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, so she was, like, physically bullying a number of students, specifically, like, she, I think this was, ki like, literally kindergarten or first uh, grade was, like, bullying a number of the boys, and in retaliation, we, because I used to technically be one of them, um, responded, and it, there was this sort of, like, gendered warfare on the playground, and I don't remember it ever escalating to the point of, like, requiring adult intervention, um, but there was definitely, like, a physical component of, like, hitting each other back and forth to it um, in this, like again, like, very sexed and gendered way. And I really can't recall what it was that started it, except that, like, I distinctly remember Jackie, like, physically, like, scratching one of my friends on the arm. Um, and that just, like, kicked off this, like, and, you know, in my head, it's, like, warfare. It lasted years and years. But in reality, of course, I'm sure it was, you know, the span of a couple days on the playground. Um but then I also remember, like, early, uh, not uh, late elementary school, early middle school, when, like, a lot of the guys, the boys were, like, really into, um, were, like, either already into or really getting into sports, and were also coming into a particular flavor of their toxic masculinity. Um, so, and or were developing their interest in, like, women and or, like, uh, 
that's sort of like sort of like you know like preteen tittering around like sexual content um and i just remember being like really repulsed by not the notion of sexuality but by like the ways that they were engaging with it um and I was going somewhere with this. Yeah, I when I hit middle school, my entire experience of gender flipped. Like, I was almost exclusively friends with girls from sixth grade on. Um, I got out of the, like, very small social pool that was elementary school and all of a sudden had way more people to become friends with. And I was like, oh, actually, these guys suck and I don't like any of them. Or at least most. I, like, to this day, there are a handful that I'm like, oh, they were good eggs. Um, who have, like, a special place in my heart. But, like, you know, for the majority, like, I really have been mostly friends with women since then um or at least, very least non uh like non-straight men um so yeah those were the early experiences i distinctly remember when i started to figure out lgbtq stuff um i had a number of friends who were like trying to provoke me into having asexuality when i was in like late middle school um, specifically boy space friends, um, who were, like, trying to, like, get me to not be a prude or whatever it was they thought I was, and from there, I just started doing my own, re and I'm pretty sure it was, like, GLAD or, like, GLSE, like, one of those, you know, like, now very, like, established nonprofits that at the time, I think, was significantly younger and newer and, like, had all the, like, basic language on their website, maybe it was even PFLAG, around, like, oh, like, what does each of the letters stand for? And ironically enough, I distinctly remember reading through it and getting to the T and getting to like transgender. And it, like, for whatever reason, the definition made me go, oh, well, that's not me <laughs> because I don't want to like alter my body. Like, I don't want to like get sex reassignment surgery. So that can't possibly be me. Um, <laughs> and like, joke's on us. Here we are all these years later. Um <laughs> Yeah, and then you like I really you know figured out that I was into not I mean I it became very obvious um, once I started developing like sexual and romantic attraction to boys that I was like gay or queer or whatever you know word we would use now given that I'm not a man um, who's attracted to men um, and from there it was just like a very steady i remember i spent most of ninth grade terrified of being in the closet um i remember like actively thinking as i walked through the halls if the way that i was walking was going to give myself away and then at some point in 10th grade i was just like fuck i'm like i'm gonna do it like i'm gonna come out and it's gonna be like this thing and then we're, i'm gonna do it and that will have been the thing and then i will be out um as though it happens the one time uh yeah um I don't know. Am I getting ahead of myself if I moved too quickly to the no, next question? No, 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 please. This is great. Yeah. Um, so I can tell you, like, you know, quintessential queer 101, uh, my coming out story. I have always had a particular, like, vibration to activist and or, like, bigger picture meaning questions and question marks. And I decided to come out on Day of Silence. <laughs> so I wrote in Sharpie, I'm gay on my hands. Um, like, came out to my mother in the morning, duct tape on my mouth, went to school, came out on the bus to friends, um, you know, had, like, the little day of... I actually... So it's one of the things I've kept. I still have it um, in, like, a box on my bookshelf in my uh, office. Um, I still have the, like, little slip of paper that was like, this is what Day of Silence is. Um, and then I attached the duct tape that I had worn to the back of the paper... Um, and so I still have it. Um, and when I hit my 10 year anniversary of having come out as gay in high school two years ago while I was in law school <laughs> with your spouse, um, I, you know, I posted like a 10 year anniversary, like set of photos on social media. And one of the photos was a photo that I had taken of the duct tape on the paper. Um, and like had very, again, like very affirming reactions from basically all of my close friends. Uh, like everybody who mattered to me in terms of school, like was like totally okay with it. Um, except for one girl who was really upset and it literally turned out because she was, uh, it, like she had a crush on me and she was really upset that I was not attracted to her. Um, which like, I, I appreciate the vote of confidence. Uh, <laughs> um, but the reaction from my parents was like very much the opposite. It was like, you're not allowed to come out to your family or sisters either 
overall or yet it's too soon, whatever. Um, and like, are you sure? I still remember um, my mom like sat me down. Uh, actually, this was not after I initially came out. This was many months later. I came out to my older sister that fall she i was in high school so she was already in college which means that she was home for thanksgiving and i told her that i wanted to come out to the family at thanksgiving because we always hosted and i was like well everyone will be there it's convenient (laughs) again like i'll do it in one go it will be really easy um and she told my mom and my mom was like first of all absolutely not second of all like are you sure like this is going to make your life way worse um and also like i never want to see you in a dress And, like, all of those things hurt. That last one really, really hurt because it was, like, you're still trying to define a particular, like, thing for me um, or define a way something for me. So that was, like, the background in which I was coming out as trans in college. Um, I definitely skipped very hard, uh, very far ahead of the original question, which was about gendered experiences. Um, But when I was in college... Um, I mean, a number of things happened. One, I developed a number of, at the time, like close friendships with, um, cis men, like queer cis men, um, through our LGBTQ group. And like, they were not exclusively my only friends, but they were like, for the first time since before middle school, I had like my closest friend circle included, um, boys. Um, and... The organization kind of in part because the organization itself went through like waves. Um, There would often be like lots of queer women and then like lots of queer men. And like the organization tended to be dominated by like whichever community was represented by the at the time president. Um, Because certain divisions just have not been worked through yet. Um, uh, Hilariously enough, then of course, a ray, uh, like a rain of us were non cis folks uh, in hindsight. Um, So, the organization was dealing with a number of those issues. Um, and basically the only at the time out trans person, uh, I microaggressed them very early on during my presidency and they like rightfully snapped at me. They were very upset. Um, and I was trying to figure out what to do and, or what I was supposed to be doing, uh, in my role as president, um, coming off of a previous president who had, uh, so I, I ran and became president because uh, we basically organized in opposition to a president who was bullying and harassing the other membership. Um, and I like our slate of candidates won. We voted him out, so on and so forth. But um, I basically had to like clean up a mess and figure out what was going to happen next, all of while trying to rebuild our like reputation with the administration and the other student organizations. And I mean, quite, I was putting like 20 hours a week and for, 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 for an unpaid student organization, which like for those of us who get really involved, like it's not really surprising that it kind of like sucked me into it. Right. And like sucked all of this time out of my life. Um, and I remember I was on the way actually to pick up my younger sister who I was already out to, um, as gay, um, that happened at some point while, I was in either late high school or early college. Um, and so this would have been fall junior year of college. That would have been fall 2015. Um, my younger sister was going to visit. She was touring colleges and wanted to visit the university of Miami where I was at for school. And so I was on the like Metro rail to pick her up from the airport and take her back to campus, um, for her visit. She was, I think she stayed with me. I could be wrong. Um, I was just like thinking through all this in my head, like listening to music, I assume, because that's what I'm always doing. And I just remember like staring like vacantly into a non-existent distance that only I could see being like, why do I feel like I am not capable of whatever it is that I've been accused of? And I just have this little voice in the back of my head that just goes, because you're not cisgender. And And I remember going, Oh, absolutely not. Like, we are not having this conversation. Like, I have to go pick up my little sister. I do not have time for this right now. Um, And, like, that was really the start of the gender questioning of, like, oh. um, And, like, unraveling that thread that I mentioned earlier of, like, oh, well, just because I don't want 
means or doesn't like means I am or I am not trans. And like turns out that was not the case, um, as evidenced by my she slash they pronouns. Um, and so from there, it was sort of like a slow descent into figuring out uh, like who I am and what my gender is. Um, and it took a while, in part because when I finally came out as trans, um, about a year and a half later, in spring 2017, my senior year of college, um, again, my immediate family took it very negatively. Um, I came out distantly. Like the, I tried to come out to my mother in person, and I couldn't do it. I broke down crying in the car. Um, and at, she later told me that she could tell that there was something uh, – not wrong is not the right word, but that there was something like that I was upset about that I wanted to tell and I just couldn't. Um, during one of our many like post coming out conversations, um, sort of debriefs after a lot of harm between us. Um, so I came out to them via email because um, I just couldn't not be out anymore. And then I came out to like everybody on Facebook. Um, I was like a very well known activist i'm i can't rightly call it. um even though i would like to be uh, uh like a, a very well-known entity around town um by virtue of how many organizations i was in how much i yelled at student affairs administration uh <laughs> administrators uh which i continued to do in college um i i was a known quantity and it was a big deal for a lot of people for me to be coming out um i came out on facebook and basically my immediate family like cut me out. They were like, what are you about this? Like we are incredibly upset both about the fact that you are trans and the way you told us. Um, and when we finally reconnected, um, my parents effectively gaslit me for another year and a half into questioning whether or not I actually counted as trans. Um, of like, well, if you don't want to transition, basically did to me what I had already done to myself by virtue of misperceptions and incoherent language around whether or not I could be considered trans or non-binary, what is the right term, what do I feel, um, into basically like backtracking around what my own gender I um, until I started law school in fall 2018. Um, I, I worked for a year between degrees, so I graduated college 2017 and started law school fall 2018. And we had a big blowout fight because I had, you know, moved to DDC, and I distinctly remember going, "Law school is going to be uh, brutal, and I should set up with a therapist now." <laughs> so I literally, before the semester started, had gone to the Georgetown Laws, um, like, "How do I, I just know I'm going to need it?" And they had recommended me to a gender therapist off, uh, like, uh, you know, like off campus, um, like in private practice. And um, they were going to be really expensive. And I remember being like, I don't want to talk to my parents about it, but like the counseling center is recommending this to me and it would cost a lot of money. So let me see what my parents will say. And the response was incredibly hostile to the extent that it actually snapped me out of where I had been for about 18 months. And okay, I'm not going to, going to have to not be able to rely on them. I'm going to have to be able to rely on myself or whatever else it is to figure this out because they're just not comfortable with this. Um, could not afford the external gender therapist without them. Uh, so I did therapy through Georgetown Laws Counseling Center um, and then ultimately switched over to a low-income clinic where I was for a number of years before getting health insurance. And now I now I'm in private. Now I see someone in private practice. Um, but that was very much the journey of it as it was shaped by I mean the folks around me. Yeah, that's um, wow. Same, honestly. <laughs> like <laughs> um, I, I'm sure Kelly uh, has told you some of our background you know like she was uh oh, we were both involved in the exact board of our uh gsa at school and college and um in florida yeah, if i recall correctly you do you sure do <laughs> um yeah i honestly think we were involved in getting at least two people in the administra administration to quit their jobs um and so <laughs> yeah I, I i feel that and 
yeah, the way that you see at the time, you know, in like 2010, 2011, around there, the way that you saw trans people represented, it was that very single track of this is a, you know, a white trans woman and, you know, she's had X, Y, and Z surgeries. So that's what it means. And, you know, that's like a, I feel like that's what I saw, at least, you know, growing up, like, and it never clicked. Like, even in college, I had trans friends and I was like, good for you, you know, like, could it be me, but good for you. (laughs) Yeah, I, listen, I still remember Leverin Cox. Like, that to me is always going to be like, um, like the zero, zero point on the graph is like, uh, not for like my own. I mean, not for my own perceptions of what I wanted for myself, but in terms of like, oh, being trans can be something that is, one, not bad, and two, the bad shit is coming from the social norms around it, not from being trans. Uh, Like I, the yeah, like when Orange is the New Black came out and she was in that role, and you know, so many, I am far from the first person to point this out, like the writers chose to give her the role of the hairstylist. Like they gave her a position of deep social influence and power within the black like um, community for women. And they were like, we, we're actually giving her this particular position because it's really important for us that she be known as this individual. She is not going to be a write-off over here on the side. Like we're giving her a really central position. Um, And that was, like, like truly, at the time, for me, it was, like, really revolutionary um, to the point that I'm getting, like, a little bit teary-eyed about it. Um, And then the big one for everybody, I think, who wasn't queer uh, was, like, the whole Caitlyn Jenner stuff. But even saying her name is already too much for this conversation. So that's going to be the only (laughs) reference we do to her. Um, uh, Because I that one was, like, the mainstreaming of the conversation in a way. But, like... I, at least for me, and I feel like for a lot of the other queer folks, it, it was always Laverne. I totally feel that. Yes, she was the first, like, any vague sense of positive uh, anything that I had heard about a trans person. Because before, it for me at least, it was um, Boys Don't Cry. Like, my mom had watched that movie in the 90s, and, like, throughout my childhood, she was just like, do not, don't, just don't do it. <laughs> so, yeah, it, uh, that's... Another topic for another day. <laughs> but well, um, and conveniently, like we don't have to <laughs> like we don't have time to have that conversation. And luckily it's already been had. Like you got like disclosure is out. It is on Netflix. It's a great documentary for everybody listening <laughs> to this recording. Like watch the celluloid closet too while you're at it. Like these things exist. Um you and I don't have to go there. It's been done. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> um So, yeah, let's uh, talk a little bit about the, I guess, the law school years, if that's cool with you, Um, because that's, (laughs) I know from watching uh, Callie, uh, it is a a whole experience. Um, What was law school like, not just in terms of gender, but just like in terms of things? Oh. (laughs) <laughs> so very infamously uh, Michelle Obama in Becoming which I actually still haven't finished please don't at me I apologize I'm I'm chipping away at it um, apparently she like very infamously like refused to say anything about like I think she has like a single line where she's like I attended Harvard Law and that's where I met Barack and that's like it like refused she was like and it was like a whole snub um I prefer to do the opposite. I prefer to drag Georgetown Law's name through the mud. Um, I, it was brutal. Um, ironically enough, I really liked my first year-ish. Um, I mean, it comes with all of the ups and downs that being in the first year of law school entails, but I actually found it. I, I remember describing it to someone at the time as, I feel like I am going to the gym eight hours a day for my brain. Um, and I actually, I adored that, uh, contrary to a lot. I mean, I had plenty of imposter syndrome, like, excuse me, like, like the race, class, gender dynamics of the space. But in terms of the academics, I literally remember the first week 
actually, it might have even been the first class. I remember like sitting down. I remember just being there, like participating in class or being in class, or whatever, and just going like, "Oh yes, like this is where I'm supposed to be. Like I did the right thing in both going to go to in choosing to go to law school." And in going to this law school, like this is the right place for me to be at. And I still don't disagree with those notions, uh, even though I do think that Georgetown is like an irredeemable institution. Um, so I was the only sucker willing to be president of Outlaw my 2L year, which was, if I recall, Kelly's 1L year, because Kelly was only one year below me. I also knew a number of folks who were two years below me who were Ronalds when I was 3L, but Callie was class of 2022, right? Yeah. Okay. I have yes. This time yes, she was. Um, so, yeah. Something that I actually don't know if Callie knows this, because um, I, so, at the end of my year, um, I had one of my, one of the people who was part of my close knit circle of friends from college from the lgbtq group in college um was hospitalized in a coma and died um very suddenly over the course of about three to five days um in the middle of that year's orientation um and i was basically not necessarily forced but I, there was definitely a, like an expectation that I would continue to participate in all of the various orientation activities as president of Outlaw. Um, at the same time that I was like actively in the middle of being at a loss for words at having someone like like very kin to me like just dying, um, and so I was dealing with that and simultaneously trying to provide like a healthy, safe, welcoming, inviting environment for all of these incoming like queer and trans law students and also for like the section three folks in general um and so it was a really really i mean i the first half even of that year was brutal um for that reason and then we kind of were gonna do a full reset (laughs) and then uh you know famous last words it was the spring of 2020 um Bam. Um, you know what I will say is that I always like to say that Georgetown is a very robust underbelly. Um, it is large enough that it, and it is, um, it occupies like a very weird place. Um, so many people who want to go into public interest go to Georgetown even if we don't fit the mold of who Georgetown wants us to be because it is an avenue to public interest work. Um, it is, I think it places as a percentage of its outgoing students, it is the second highest percentage of students who go into public interest of all law schools in the country, second only to CUNY, the City University of New York Law School, which is famously public interest. I, like, you know, Georgetown, I think it's like 20% of students, CUNY it's like 40 or something like that. Um, yeah, so we're huge, and we have a fairly large set of resources for public, public interest students um, that, quite frankly, do not really meet, um, but are, exist nonetheless separate from the private practice resources. Um, and at most law schools, those are the only ones that exist. So there is this like robust network of faculty and students and administrators on this like underbelly side who actually do give a shit, who actually care, who have like grounded values, whether we call that like socialist, progressive, leftist, whatever, um, including professors who engaged in protests with us and who wrote letters and signed letters with us and this and that. Um, but then, you know, we also, the flip side, we had not just conservative professors, but we had very like middle of the road professors who really wanted to help um, move things along, but only according to their own principles or practices. Um, like really at odds with what students were asking for or telling them. Um, it came to, I mean, I can give you several points. So I was on top of being president of Outlaw, my 2L year, I was also all three years, mainly 1L and 2L year. I was involved with National Lawyers Guild, our student chapter um, at Georgetown. So 
I was one of the co-organizers and participants in the protest against Kevin McAleenan, who at the time was acting DHS secretary, although I believe it was later determined that he was illegally elevated to acting role. So I think he technically doesn't even qualify as acting um, when you like go through and document because of like all the shit that Trump pulled to get people he wanted into acting positions. But hey, that's a we're not, we don't have time for all that. Um, uh, he was invited as a keynote. Uh, as the keynote speaker to Georgetown's like annual immigration policy conference in fall 2019, like to all year. And um, he was like actively involved with the creation and implementation of family separation. So a group of us said, absolutely fuck this. And organized. and I have actually a photo saved on my laptop somewhere um, of like, it, it's like us right as we were about to start the protest. Um, so like, uh, outside of the auditorium. So there's like a bunch, uh, there was like outside of the auditorium and then a group of us who were protesting inside the auditorium. Um, and the, uh, I mean, a number of my classmates had great signs. I have a personal favorite, which is, uh, my friend Tamar Hoffman's, um, who I believe was one of class, uh, Callie's classmates. Um, uh, Tamar is Jewish Israeli, uh, is an anti-occupationist, like has like very grounded principles and is like also one of the like cleverest people I know. Uh, she had a sign that just said, this is some straight up Nazi bullshit. <laughs> and it's like right front and center in this photo that somebody took of us right as we're about to start doing the protest chants. Um, and it's great. Uh, so anyway, so I participated in that and like, you know, we then like did a subsequent, um, like organizing around their then attempts on student free speech on campus. So there was massive turnout to this big um, like town hall that they held where they were basically like, we're going to implement a bunch of things because we think it will make things more respectful. And we were like, you are just trying to constrain student opposition to like deeply, deeply conservative politics on campus that are actually putting students in harm's way as was brought up bringing a member of the U.S. cabinet, albeit illegally appointed, to campus implicates law enforcement in a way that is threatening to undocumented students at the law center, um, as well as students who have a car source threat. Like, it's incredibly destructive. So anyways, that's a whole thing. Um, that all happened my two all year. Um, pandemic, <laughs> gestures vaguely. Um, uh, my three all year, is when, which would have been Callie's 2 year, it, my, the spring semester, uh, so I was always involved with a lot of things. Um, I served on the student faculty finance committee, my 2L and 3L year. Um, and then 3L year had run for and was elected to um, student bar association, like the law school student government as a 3L representative. And like the terms run from like March to March. So it was like we were elected and like our first meeting was going to be like the week after uh, spring break to all year. And <laughs> that whole term ended up being virtual. Um, and uh, Olivia Heinrich killed it as president uh, to this day. Um, still my president. Uh, I was on, uh, in addition to being on the student faculty finance committee, I was also then asked to serve on the student faculty committee. And spring three all year, right before the end of our term, like literally it was in the intermediate period between the next elections where I believe Jade Baker had just won. Um, yes, because Melody, yes, I have that right. So it was because it was, yeah. So Jade Baker had just won and was like, due to start her term as the first black president of the SBA in the universe and the law school's history. And in between like the election and the like changeover meeting for SBA where like we would get give our goodbyes and they would be welcomed in as the new like SBA board and house of delegates. Um, the video of two professors demeaningly speaking about their students of color, specifically black students in the classroom, uh, during the like, not, I almost said intermission. Um, during the like break in the middle of their class was recorded in a zoom uh flagged by students and sent to the administration as hey what the fuck you need to do something about this 
and they refused. And it was uh, my classmate and good friend Hassan uh, who leaked it on Twitter. And I made a Twitter so that I could follow him and retweet it. <laughs> um, as a little, like, fun little aside, because this is an oral history, and I, I'm, I have a deep, unab- uh, like, a deep abiding love for oral histories. I did a project on LGBTQ oral history in college. Um, uh, just so that this is forever recorded. Um, the first thing I did when I joined Twitter was block Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> Which I find incredibly funny, given that, Like, I stopped using Twitter a a year later in, like, spring 2022, and then six months after I left Twitter, he bought it out. Uh, (laughs) So I proactively anticipated all of that, apparently. Um, But, yeah, I was involved in, like, this massive student – I mean, in a very small way. I was not central to the conversations. But those of us who had been on the diversity committee had spent the entire year telling all of the faculty, like, hey, you guys aren't doing enough. Like, hey, these are not radical enough proposals. Like, hey, this is too tepid. Hey, you're not going, like, you're expecting labor from us and you're not recognizing our value. You're not compensating us for this. Um, And and like, sure, you all aren't being compensated, but your faculty, you're being paid to work here. We're students, we're paying to be here, not the same dynamic. Um, And on top of that, we have other obligations that we have to meet on. And this is on top of all of that. Um, And we wrote, like, a very strong response that was basically like, you guys have fucked up. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. (laughs) Uh, It was way better written than that. We were all a bunch of law students. Um, But, yeah, I mean, we really castigated um, student administration. I apparently had developed a reputation for it. At one point, I had to meet with an administrator about something uh, individually regarding, like, my own academics. And uh, we had only ever known each other in passing before through like the more like advocacy and like student government and like sort of like student affairs side of things. We had like been in meetings and stuff before, but we had never like one-on-one tatted. And I was like, he was like, Oh, like, you know, like obviously we've known about each other in passing. And I was like, Oh, like what is my reputation? And he just went, you're known for being a very zealous advocate for your constituents, (laughs) which is code word for, I would literally yell at administrators. Uh, who would come to the Student Bar Association with proposals um, that were totally two-faced, um, that were really under-resourced, um, that hell, were kind of trying to slip something by us and get our seal of approval. And, like, I would often be one of the first people to say, I, certainly not the only one, but I was often one of those people who would be like, actually, I don't like this. Like, there's nobody's willing to say anything right now. I'll say it. The emperor's not wearing clothing. Um... And so I have it as like a small point of pride that so many folks from student affairs are no longer there. Not quite frankly because they were bad people, but because they were working for someone who was awful. And they have all moved on to better jobs, even though he is still there. But um, <laughs> I digress. So those are my experiences at Georgetown. Um, I, the academics like truly were, I think, robust. But I also picked professors in a very particular way. Um, I mostly picked prof- – I had a number of classes that I was interested in taking and or wanted to take, and I took those classes. But by and large, I took the versions of those classes that were taught by professors whose politics I liked and whose personalities I liked, um, because I was not going to take a class with a professor who was not going to be able to hold space for me. Um, and so in terms of my own gendered experience, I did at the start of every semester, I emailed all of my professors to introduce myself and let them know what my pronouns were. And it did not stop me from getting misgendered. Um, my first year... One of my favorite professors, actually, um, like very embarrassingly, like he he was incredibly embarrassed by himself to the point that he froze on stage and did not know what to do, Um, misgendered me. And I corrected him and he paused and went, wait, what? And I said it again. Um, and he was just completely frozen. And one of my classmates said, like, like one of my classmates jumped in to maneuver and navigate the conversation and move the cold call forwards. Um, he he had no idea how to navigate that. Um, uh, I don't think I ever had a professor who was actively hostile to me. I did have classmates who were. Um, I learned that there was a classmate, at least one, who... I had just assumed she was misgendering me by accident. And then one of my closest friends said, no, Jeremy, she's doing that on purpose. I actually asked her about it. I, 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 you know, went up to her at one point and said like, oh, hey, you keep misgendering Jeremy. And she said, oh yeah, no, I'm doing it on purpose. 
Um, and so the, like space was really, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, at one point I had to like ream out a bunch of administrators about the fact that, I mean, one, we already had virtually, I, we had across the entire campus and maybe three to five gender inclusive restrooms. Um, and they were not evenly spaced around the campus. They were not all in coherently useful places. Um, and the only one that was close to any of the major lecture halls at one point for a period of time just didn't have toilet paper in it. So for, actually it was, uh, spring 2020, it was the start of the back half of my 2 all year and my fourth semester. And like from January through when we went virtual, like I was just constantly, at first I was like emailing them and then I was in meetings with them and I was telling them and then I was in meetings with them and I was like, ex like ye yelling and or begging them um, because I had to go like multiple floors up. I had to take an elevator to get to, and to go to the other side of the building to where the other restroom was in the building because um, it was the only one available um, that had toilet paper in it. Um, and then I was missing class and I had to go up to the, I, I didn't have to, but I, I went up to the professor and apologized and he was like, that's totally not your fault, but it also meant that I was still missing class. Um, and then, you know, I was going back, um, into the recordings to catch what I had missed because I, I had to fucking pee. Um, so that's Georgetown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, first I want to say there's something. It, it, there's no feeling like being asked to be on a diversity council. Like, that's just, I've been there too. And let me say, wow, I, that, is, that is quite a thing. Um, two, all those meetings were for toilet paper? Like, no, to get... uh, Not all of them. Uh, so the meetings were not specifically about toilet paper. The meetings were okay. about, like, DEI issues on campus. And okay. I had to keep bringing up that quite literally, like, it's great that y'all want to talk about all these high-minded issues. I literally can't fucking pee. Yeah. Uh, like, literally, I had to say that in a meeting. I had to be like, I, it was a meeting around the issues that, like, uh, for whatever reason, I got roped into. I, I feel very, like, one of my mentors in college was the one of the founders and or presidents of the Women of Color Collective. And I think because of my reputation, because I'm a, like, trans femme individual, even though I'm white, I was invited into a lot of spaces that were predominantly women of color. Um, and so it was a meeting of like DEI around specifically issues for like, like non cis white women. Like it was like the issues for like women of color and like queer and trans women. Um, I presume because again, like I was there and I think I was one of the only white people in the room. Um, and like, I, I just had to be like, guys, I literally cannot pee. Like, I've been missing class this week. Um, and I, it's actually really funny. One of my friends had, we ran into each other on our way into the meeting. We were both running late from a different DEI thing. Because, again, like, they just want us to do everything. And so we're running late. She, she just looked at me and she just went, I'm so fucking sick of this bullshit. <laughs> and then, like, she says that as we're, we immediately go into the room. And then we have to just, like... Just deal with all the bullshit. Yes. I, God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, I mean, yeah, you you know it. <laughs> um, so I want to be cognizant of time. We're approaching 7 o'clock. Um, I have two questions for you, but we can save those for another time if that's preferable. Totally up to you. Okay. Um, if, if you've got time for it, I will uh, ask first of the two cool um so i this is i think my 13th or 14th interview with um you know different trans people and um it, it's been fascinating to see how everyone approaches transition differently um some people were like i was five years old and i knew i you know my genitals didn't work for me or something like that. You know, some people then like, you know, right out the bat, like very explicit with it, but fewer folks have been like, you know, no, I don't want to, you know, have any surgery or anything. And I was just curious, what's like, you know, what's your experience with that? And what is, you know, your advice to somebody who, you know, may not feel, you know, quote unquote trans enough, you know? 
Um, yeah, that was one of the many issues I experienced slash still experience with or have experienced in a lot of trans spaces um, or with trans folks is either that actual experience or a like fear of or anxiety of experiencing that um, in part because I've experienced it before and in part because I'm just like afraid of experiencing it either again or in general. Um, you know, like I mentioned, when I first learned what transgender was, I was like, well, that can't be me because I don't want surgery. <laughs> Like, I don't want bottom surgery. And, I mean, I didn't know that it was called bottom surgery at the time. But, um, so a few different things. Um, I do still remember when I started growing facial hair. And I remember thinking, like, I mean, not you, gross, but it was something along those lines. <laughs> and I remember being, like, I, like, this, I was, like, I remember, like, I want to remove this from my face and, like, give it to somebody else. Um, like I, it's not for me. And at the time, like I thought it was like Peter Pan syndrome. I was like, oh, it's because it's a sign of like getting older and I don't want to age, blah, blah, blah. Like I, it's this like transition from childhood to adulthood. Also facial hair has like very particular connotations within the Jewish space that was really like fucking with me. Um, ironically enough, in contrast to my body hair, which I've always been fairly comfortable with. Um, but so I... <laughs> Uh, like, have known for, you know, at least a decade that I've hated facial hair, and when I started figuring out my gender, it started clicking for me that this was a gender issue, um, and not something else, and so it's one of the pieces of physical transition that I'm, like, very, very affirmatively interested in, um, is getting rid of this shit, um, but, you know, as I was figuring out my gender, I knew for a fact that I did not want to fit into some sort of binary, like, I was like, I am not interested in trading one particular prison for another. Um, at least is, like, my experience of it. Like, some people find a deep sense of comfort in their redefined binary experience. That was not it for me. Um, and so I, this, I liked this metaphor back before What's-Her-Face from Arizona became an independent. Um, I liked it when it was just Bernie Sanders and Angus King. Um, but I use cinema. That's her name. Uh, I, for a number of years now, I have described my gender as this for people who like, don't understand, like, how can you be transgender and non-binary isn't like one or the other, like you're she, they, like, oh, and I go, I am a gender independent who caucuses with the women. Well, actually I say the girls, but like, <laughs> cause like, it's the girls. Uh, yeah. And like, I actually, ironically, I have found that that worked really well for people because it's like, oh. Okay, because, like, they have a mental model for it, and then it works. It's like, okay, Jeremy isn't a woman or a girl, but, like, caucuses with – like, goes into that space. And it works for people. Um, so I, I really struggled. Like I said, you know, like, at first when it came out, I thought that I had to be transgender, and it was really conflicted over the fact that I didn't feel like a binary trans woman. Um, and even now, I wouldn't – I don't – Think I can even claim trans woman. Um, I don't think womanhood is a thing that I get to have, not because I have to do certain things to have it, but because it just does not feel like a space that is for me to put my hand on. Um, but I do say trans femme, or at the very least trans femme-ish. Uh, what can I say? I'm good with like a tape measure. I'd like to think I'm like a little bit butch, but like not mostly, just like a little bit. <laughs> Um, like around the edges, uh, like I think Butch is fun to cosplay as, um, but I certainly don't prefer to live there. Um, so I knew that I wasn't binary trans. And then again, I kind of got gaslit into this full, like misperception of myself, um, after reconnecting with my immediate family a few months after I had come out. Um, and then I was like, well, I'm just going to use they, them. And like that also felt very wrong because I was like, I am in this space of like, I mean, it felt wrong procedurally to like have who I was going to be defined by my family. But it also felt wrong because I was like, this is also just not correct. And then I was able to settle on this happy meet. Like, and I truly like am somewhere in between. Like, I do not consider myself transgender, period. I do not consider myself non-binary, period. I consider myself trans non-binary, whether that's a hyphen or a slash or however we define it. 
because like I'm trans non-binary. Like I am a little bit trans and a little bit non-binary. I'm not one or the other, which in and of itself is like a fun little fuck you to the notion of the binary between them in the first place. <laughs> I thank you. I want to say thank you. You have been the first person I've talked to who has articulated my own gender in a way that I understand. <laughs> Um, because same, just opposite end, you know? So that it's, um, makes me so happy. It's the Spider-Man meme. Yes, that's it. That's it. <laughs> or actually even, it's also that, um, I actually don't know what it's from, but it's that thing of like, is it Anna Kendrick and the other person like passing each other in the car with the little <laughs> car on their face? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have articulated it perfectly. <laughs> I was like, I always knew Jeremy was cool, but like, wow, this makes more sense now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, so ironically enough, um, my dad was really proud of me for this. In college, I went a little overboard with my academics. Um, but one of the things I did was I minored in LGBTQ studies, um, which you'll be shocked to learn from the way that I think and talk about the world. Um, but I also, one of the reasons I was able to do it is that I convinced my parents that I could fit it into my schedule because I got scholarships for it because uh, they had a scholarship for it if you were either pre-law, pre-medicine, or pre-nursing and you signed up for the LGBTQ studies minor, you could get a scholarship. And so my parents were, th my mom was less so because she was like, do you have time? Like, you already do so much. And my dad was like, it's free money, take it. <laughs> And then they didn't have an out, enough applicants the second year, so I applied for it and got it again because they were like, we literally don't have enough people applying. Um, so if you want it a second year, like, we will give you a second round of the scholarship. And I was like, again, it is free money. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. I love that. <laughs> um, so I guess uh, to wrap things up a little bit, I my the last question I've been asking, I think is probably my favorite. It's... Um, what do you see as the future for trans people and what gives you hope? It's a two-parter. Oh, devastating. Um, all right. I, so I mentioned I'm Jewish. Um, so you'll be shocked to learn from everything you've experienced about me in the last hour that I have uh, pre-planned my midlife crisis. I will be going to rabbinical school at some point. Um, so I'm going to give you like a very me slash rabbinical esque slash Jewish answer, which is I don't think there is a future for trans people. I don't think there is one single future for trans people. I think there are a lot of them, um, both in the sense that I don't think it has been defined yet. And I also don't think it's going to be just one. Um, so that's my like answer to that first one. The second one I struggle with, I have really bad suicidal ideation. And so, and my therapist is off this week. So <laughs> um, it's been a particularly virulent this week. Um, but even in a good week, I think I, I don't know if that's true. I think there are days and or weeks that I have like a very coherent answer to this question. Um, for me, there's two pieces to hope. There is removing like the disillusionment, uh, how to explain this? It requires or involves both the removal of the bad and the provision of the good. It's not enough to do one or the other, right? If we add good, like if we have a bunch of bad shit in front of us, it's not enough to simply put nothing. And it's not enough to just add some good stuff to the mix because we still got a bunch of bad shit in front of us. Like we have to do both. And so my experiences really are like when I have experienced both of those, I've experienced the clearing away or the, ver the um, yeah, like the clearing away of like harm and the provision of care for me is where I get hope. Um, it's fewer and further between than I would like, at the very least, right in this particular phase of my life. Um, I don't think that's unique to people who are in their 20s. Uh, <laughs> um, but, like, that experience of having unbridled compassion or love from people, like, that gives me hope. Along with, like, when I have, like, either for myself or others experienced, 
like truly cathartic um, or I, profound is not the right word. Um, like a truly rectifying healing from harm, um, which comes with, right, like at least in the Jewish faith and the Jewish tradition, like healing requires not just the reparations for what has been done, right, not just setting the bone, um, but also like the implementation of not causing that harm again. Like it's not enough to say that we have set someone's bone if we don't do something about the thing that caused the fracture in the first place. Um, and so I say that because like my perception of what constitutes healing is not merely just the healing part. It's also that second piece. Um, and when I've experienced both of those with and or parallel to that experience of like truly um, divine in a way, even when it comes from another person, care, like that for me is what gives me hope. And I don't have an example that comes to mind right now, um, but that's what comes to mind for me. That's what hope is, or that's what hope brings me. I love that. That, I, that just... I, I love that definition. That that makes me happy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, any any parting words? Anything else you want to add? Anything you want to make sure gets recorded? I'm obsessed with everything you have in the background. I like. <laughs> I logged on. I was like, oh, not only does Cooper have like a full like gamer bro setup here, but it's also like <laughs> proliferated with all of this like queer bullshit in the background that is like listen just because i have this gender doesn't mean i don't have this gender <laughs> <laughs> like it's uh it's delicious and delightful and i love that i'm seeing stuff that i've seen on your social media um like in the background here and like recognizing it um yeah it, it's very like uh yeah it's very like hang green energy <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much that makes me so happy um yeah i uh am always worried that i'm gonna get on a call like this and people are gonna be like what what is wrong with you <laughs> like so hearing the opposite of that is very affirming and a thank you for oh that. i mean we can have like a little bit of that there's nothing wrong with what the fuck is well yeah 100 <laughs> i yes i totally feel that thank you so much and thank you so much for this call this was so lovely i really just want to express to you how high of an opinion I hold of you. You are such an amazing person and one of the first trans people I met when we moved to DC and you have just been so wonderful and such a beacon of inspiration for me. So thank you. I have to learn how to take the compliment. Um, so I'm going <laughs> to say thank you. <laughs> I was and or will, I, I am going to also provide you with the, op, like the inverse. Like I, like, we have barely gotten to see each other because our lives are so busy. But yet, and yet, I am constantly in awe. I mean, it's not out of surprise, but out of consistent, like, recognition of, like, how cool it is. Like, you do so many things for yourself and for others. Like, this project alone is just a piece of it, right? Um, there is the artwork that you do. You're putting together a zine. Like, you do so many things. Um, and truly it is, um, under, I don't mean underground as in it's not known underground in that, like, it's not for the sake of building like a tower or like a pedestal. Like you're not trying to put yourself or somebody else on a thing. You're just doing this stuff because you care. And it is so, uh, refreshing, <laughs> especially in like a city that is not like that, or like a city that is populated with lots of people who are not like that. Um, but also just because, yeah, I, like, it is such a pleasure, privilege to get to, like, share space and or city. Like, space in the meaning of time and also space in the meaning of, like, literal geography with you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, now, I Now it's my turn to say I need to learn how to take a compliment because I'm just like, you know, yes, exactly. Finger guns it is. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I've got to stop the recording, but hang on for just one second. Definitely.